Greetings, this is Greg. Let's talk about aircraft turning performance, meaning minimum turn radius and maximum turn rate. Later in the video, I'll show you how to calculate these numbers for yourself. I see a lot of internet debates about which plane turned faster, this one or that one. Often, the debate is about the North American P-51 Mustang versus the Messerschmitt BF-109. By the way, really sharp observers may have noticed that wasn't a P-51 I just showed you. Here you go. There's a P-51 with the amazing Dora 9 in the background. That's a matchup I'd like to talk about another time, perhaps in another video. You can find solid evidence that the P-51 could outturn the 109 and vice versa. I'll link two videos in the description below. One shows World War II ace Bud Anderson describing a dogfight in his P-51 or he was clearly able to outturn a 109 and gain advantage. Another is a video of Skip Holm, who's a former air race pilot and test pilot for Lockheed. Skip Holm has flown both and says that the 109 will outturn the P-51. In fact, in the same video, the 109's owner, who also owns a P-51, says that the P-51 doesn't turn at all compared to the 109. The truth is, they can all be right. Different variants, fuel loads, payloads, pilot skill, possibly battle damage in some cases, can easily make the difference here. Let's take a look at the P-51's turn performance. Now there are different types of turn performance. We have the absolute maximum turn performance, which in the case of a World War II fighter can only be obtained momentarily. And we have sustained turn performance. In this video, we're going to look at maximum turn performance. For all of these examples, we're assuming that these turns are at a constant altitude. That's important. We're not talking about, well, we are talking about turns, not vertical performance. And all of these are going to be coordinated turns, not skids or half turn spins, but coordinated turns, meaning the ball and the inclinometer is in the center. For reference, we're using the book Aerodynamics for Naval Aviators. In my opinion, this is the best book on this subject, and it's a free download. Your parents paid for this book years ago. Maximum turning performance is determined by three factors. Maximum lift capacity, which is a function of wing loading and wing design. Operating strength limits, which determines how many G's the airplane can withstand. And available power. Power is very important to turn performance. A lot of people don't understand that. It's crucial for sustained turn performance, and in many cases, it's the limiting factor for maximum turn performance. The next thing we need to do is gather the data we need to do the, these calculations. I find that the official flight manuals are very useful for this, but not always perfect. Let's start out with the wing performance. For our purposes, that's going to mean the stall speed. In the condition in which maximum turn performance will be expected, that means gear and flaps up, power on. Most manuals have a chart. Here we have a chart for the P-51D. No external weapons or fuel tanks, as it would be in a dogfight. We'll go with a 9,000 pound weight. That's weight that would be pretty typical for this airplane in a dogfight. And we get a stall speed of 97 miles per hour indicated. By the way, the numbers on the far left are wrong. Later chart shows that that 99 there should be a 95. Anyhow, stall speed, 97 miles per hour indicated. Now nowhere in the manual does it say if that's with power on or off, but I'm pretty sure it's power off. But that's a variable I can't account for. Power on stall speeds in World War II airplanes are typically 8 miles per hour lower, and that would change the calculations. Next, we need to look up the maximum G load this plane can handle. This isn't as simple as you might think. It's often beyond the point at which the pilot would black out and isn't in the manual. However, most U.S. aircraft in World War II fighter planes had a max G load of 7 Gs or higher. Pilots start to black out between 4 and 6 Gs in normal conditions. With certain physical techniques, they can handle 6 to 8 Gs. And with a G suit, it adds about one more. Since most World War II U.S. planes can pull 7 Gs, I feel good about using that as our number here, especially when, since the pilots are going to black out much beyond that anyway. We will get to the issue of power soon. That's pretty easy to look up. But before we go any farther, I need to say something that tends to confuse a lot of people. The aircraft's turn radius is only controlled by two things, speed and bank angle. That's it. All the other factors are only used to determine what speed and bank angle the plane is capable of using without stalling or braking. 
You might be asking, Greg, are you saying that a SOP with Camel has the same turn radius as a Boeing 747 as long as they're at the same speed and bank angle? Yes, I am saying that. However, in that case, it's never going to happen. If you did manage to get a 747 slow enough to match the Camel's top speed, it wouldn't be able to turn at all since it would be right at its stall speed. The Camel, on the other hand, could whip into a 60 degree bank and come right around. Here's the math formula. It's in the Navy Aerodynamics book, but this image is from the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, which has a better picture. It's also a free download. You could do the math here, but I have a better way. We'll use the Navy's chart. Pilots and flight engineers love charts. I don't think I've ever seen one do the math when the chart was available. The first question we need to answer is, how much bank angle can we use in a 7G turn? The answer we get from another chart, and the answer is 81 degrees. In a constant altitude coordinated turn, G load varies with bank angle. Notice the difference between a 7G turn and an 8G turn is only one degree of bank angle. No pilot can hold bank angle within one degree for an entire 180 degree turn while sustaining 7Gs. That's another reason I'm comfortable using the 7G limit in this example, even if the actual rating for the plane is 7.5 or whatever it might be. So 81 degrees of bank and 7Gs. What's our stall speed under those conditions? This is a huge factor because our max turn performance will be at the lowest speed at which we are still going fast enough to pull our maximum Gs. To get that number, we multiply our speed by the square root of our load factor. We weigh seven times our normal amount in a 7G turn. Take the square root of seven, multiply it by 97 miles per hour, our stall speed we came up with earlier, and we get 257 miles per hour. Now we have a couple issues. First, there's a difference between indicated airspeed and true airspeed. At higher altitudes, the true airspeed is higher. For now, we'll eliminate that issue by doing our calculations for a turn at sea level. We'll get to the altitude turns a little later in the video. Second, we need to get that number into knots, not miles per hour. A quick use of an online calculator, and we get 223 knots. Now, can our P-51 go that fast at sea level? Well, we have a chart for that in the pilot's manual. Note I'm using a chart for a plane without bombs or drop tanks, but with the racks. Just about every World War II photo I've ever seen of a P-51 in a combat area, like Europe, shows them with the racks installed. This chart shows us that at max continuous power, 310 miles per hour, or 269 knots if you do the math, is attainable, uh, so the plane will reach a high enough speed at sea level to pull 7Gs. We now have everything we need. Let's graph this on the chart. We'll zoom into the lower half first to calculate our turn radius. To use this chart, find your true airspeed, which in this case is the same as our indicated speed because we're at sea level, and go up until you hit 81 degrees of bank. Go over from there, I come up with a turn radius of about 710 feet. If you want to double check mathematically, you can by taking the square of your speed and dividing it by the tangent of the bank angle, multiply by 11.26. When I do that, I get 700.4 feet, so our numbers check out. The thickness of the lines on the chart account for that 10 feet. Now let's look at turn rate. We use the same procedure and get about 29 degrees per second. Now remember, these are not sustainable turn rates. As soon as the plane feels that 7Gs, it's going to start slowing down. No World War II plane has enough power to prevent that. So as it slows, in order to prevent stalling, the pilot will need to reduce the bank angle and the g-forces. That will reduce the turn performance. At some point, he'll be at the level of drag that the engine can match, and speed, g-forces, and turn performance will stabilize, and at that point, he'll be at the maximum sustainable turn performance. Now let's look at the performance at altitude. The P-51 would often fight at 30,000 feet, so let's look at the performance way up there. At 30,000 feet, it can reach 420 miles per hour at max continuous power. That's 364 knots of true airspeed. However, indicated airspeed will be much lower, and our stall numbers are in reference to indicated speed, not true airspeed. So this is a place you can really mess this calculation up. 
our indicated speed will be only 196 knots at max continuous power at 30,000 feet. Not nearly enough to pull a 7G turn. So what's our max turn performance now? We can only pull 4Gs without stalling. Remember the math from earlier? Well, the square root of 4 is 2 times our stall speed of 97 is 194. That's close enough uh, to 196 for this type of work. So let's go back to our g-force and bank angle chart, and we come up with a 76 degree angle of bank. Let's graph the data. As you can see, turn performance suffers tremendously with altitude. The turn radius is over four times greater than it was at sea level. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and graph the F4F Wildcat, specifically the hotter FM2 version. This will provide an interesting comparison. I'll save you the trouble of looking at all the charts. The FM2 can pull 7.5 Gs, so our 7G turn is not a problem for it at sea level. It has a lower stall speed of 74.5 knots. That's power off, but it's a comparative number to the P51. That means it needs to maintain 197 knots to pull a 7G turn. I've checked the FM2 manual. It can do 245 knots at sea level. Plenty of speed. Let's graph this versus the P51. I graphed the Wildcat in blue. You can clearly see it easily outturns the P51. Of course, we need to remember these are not sustainable turn rates, but for at least a short time, the Wildcat can outturn it. Let's look at this at high altitude. At 30,000 feet, the FM2 can sustain 257 knots of true airspeed, a lot slower than the P51. Although I must say, I was surprised the FM2 can go that fast up there. But that number is right out of the manual for max continuous power at 30,000 feet. 257 knots true works out to only 139 knots indicated. That means the FM2 can only pull 3.4 Gs in these conditions. Of course, it's moving more slowly, so that will help offset this. Checking our chart, we find that works out to about 73 degrees of bank. Graphing this, the results are a bit shocking. The FM2 can actually outturn the P51 under certain conditions, even at altitude. Of course, the P-51 is faster, a lot faster. It's 125 miles an hour faster at 30,000 feet. Plus, in sustained turns, the P-51 will be better off because it has more speed to lose before the stall. In other words, when it's indicating 196 miles an hour at 30,000 feet and starts decelerating in a high G turn, it can lose 99 miles per hour of indicated speed before being out of energy and having to stop its turn. The Wildcat only has 64.5 miles per hour to play with. Plus, the Mustang is going to bleed speed more slowly. All this stuff will have to wait for another video, as sustained turn rates are really another subject. I hope you liked this video. It's been a while since I last used my flight engineer skills, but this was kind of fun for me. Let me know what you would like to see next. Please subscribe, leave comments. I'll get more videos up soon. I hope you're having a great day. Goodbye.